My point is here, brethren, he's right there with pagan philosophers. Does Paul go in and say, you know, let's let's talk about I want to do a little presentation today on creation versus evolution and things that, you know, these pagan philosophers would have believed a lot of the evolution fairy tale. All right. Evolution is not a scientific theory. It's an ancient pagan philosophy. You study some of the early philosophers that came out with the evolution nonsense. It's, it's just a, it's a pagan philosophy is what it is. All right. It's not science. Never has been. And, you know, you can get into the whole creation versus evolution thing. But again, that's, that's not supposed to be used to lead people to the Lord. You intellectually overpower them through debating and things like this. And they go, I have no other choice. The evidence is just so overwhelming. I have to become a Christian now. That isn't going to do it. It's about sin. It's about judgment. That's what it's about. Don't get pulled away from that as a Christian. These atheists come along and they say, you need to prove God exists to me. You say, uh, are you a sinner? I've done this thing over and over and over again with atheists, you know. And, and you know, I'm an atheist. You know, it's like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> like, I'm supposed to respect that. You're a fool, the Bible calls you, if you're an atheist. You know, I'm an atheist and things. And I say, okay, are you a sinner? They'll never say, yes, I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell. Never say it. Never say it. I reject your book. I reject this. I reject that. You have to prove to me scientifically. Why? Because they want to bring God down to their level so that they can say, well, he's really not much better than me. The thought of a holy, righteous God that is so perfect that he cannot allow sin in his presence unless that sin is paid for by the death of his own son. And if you don't accept that death of his son, he burns you forever and ever and ever and ever and laughs at you. They don't want to think about that. But that's the God of the Bible. Whether you choose to believe it or not. Okay, now go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 through 32. Let's read this here. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Compare to that to Second Thessalonians chapter 2. God sends them strong delusion, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Something to think about. Verse 19, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became Fools, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Yeah, they say it in their heart. It's a feeling that they have. Another one of the lies that the atheists come out with, they'll say, everybody's born an atheist, you have to be educated into religion. That's an absolute total lie. I mean, there are some times they just say, they, they make some stupid idiotic statement, and then they say, prove us wrong scientifically. <laughs> uh, you're a liar. You're a liar. The Bible says that everybody is born and they have a belief that there is a God. God gives you a conscience when you're first born. You have to kill that conscience later on. Nobody's born an atheist. All it takes is just a quick look at nature and you go, there's no way that that happened by chance. No way. Absolutely not. You have to be told by some wicked Luciferians out there that everything happened by random chance. Now you can go on living in, in your sin. You have to be told that. But what do they do with all this, uh, you know, worshiping the creation and things? Let's look at this. Verse 23. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. That's what they want to do again. See, they want to take God and they want to make him like corruptible man. And the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, 
to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. It's kind of funny because God lets them have what they want. And they get mad at God for saying, you know, hey, you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. You ought to just let us have our way. God says, okay, you can have your way. <laughs> the worst thing that can happen to you, by the way. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. Sodomy is the final sign before God's judgment comes. You say, well, man, there's a lot of sodomy in my country. I better go to another country. Well, that's right. There's pretty much sodomy in every country now. And the Vatican hirelings in government are making sure that laws are passed to protect sodomy and to perpetuate it. They want to spread it. Why? Because Satan is going to hell. He's going to the lake of fire. He's going to burn forever and ever and ever. And he wants to bring as many people with him as he can. So the best way to do it is to get people into sodomy. Nothing will bring God's wrath on a country quicker than sodomy. I mean, the very term, sodomy, is the sin of Sodom. Verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate. Interesting, because that's what they want to draw you into as a Christian. Deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, hello atheists, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, this is where the judgment is. This is what you use for the lost people. And what they want to do is they want to draw you back into the thing of, you have to scientifically prove to me. Prove this, prove that. And when you, <clears throat> if you ever see this, if you ever do this with an atheist, where you actually will try to, you know, show them, well, actually, if you study this and you study that and whatever else, you'll never convince them of anything. Never. It's a rather dangerous thing to get away from preaching righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And you get away from that, and you start to say, well, I need to you know, show them science, and I need to show proof of this and proof of that. No, you don't. All you need to do is, are you a sinner? Your sins are going to be judged someday. You say, well, I reject the book. Okay, then have at it. Take the gamble. Simple. Oh, no, but brother, I, I, I have to, to win them to the Lord, and if I don't, their blood's going to be on my hands. That's a whole other thing that you're going to hear. Uh, not at all true. If you have to actually go back to Ezekiel where that passage is, where it talks about you know, warning the wicked to turn from his wicked ways and things, and if you don't, then his blood's going to be required at your hands and all this. It's not for a Christian. Because if you look at the context, it's actually talking about if you don't warn them, then your soul, you actually lose your soul. So if you apply that to a Christian today, then if they don't witness to every lost per person that they meet and their blood's on their hands, then they could actually lose their salvation because of not witnessing. The Baptists and, and a lot of the others and things, but mostly the Baptists, have really put this thing of ultra soul winning on the brethren because they're trying to get the numbers in so they can get the money. Grow the bigger church building. So it's just win souls, win souls, win souls, win souls. Don't do anything else but win souls. Get them in here so we can get their money. And they've perpetuated this thing for so long that they twist scriptures to make you feel like you're just scum of the earth if you've not won 12 people to the Lord in, in the last hour. It's ridiculous. Our job is to preach righteousness, 
temperance, judgment to come. That's what we're supposed to do. And if people reject that, that's their problem. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17 through 21. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Hmm. Wisdom of words? Let me talk about science to you today. Uh uh, it's about sin. You see? It's about the cross of Christ. Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Very simple thing that you can say to people. They say, I'm not a bad person. Okay, then who did Jesus die for? You get in because you're not a bad person? Did he die for the really bad people? You know? He didn't die for your sins. He just died for those that are much worse, apparently. I mean, if Jesus, you know, he dies on the cross, if you can earn your salvation, why on earth did he do that? Verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? If God's made foolish the wisdom of this world, then what on earth are you doing trying to use that to witness to the lost? Hmm. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You're going to look like a fool. Oh no, I, because, you know, I've gone to the university and I have a PhD. Let's all welcome Dr. whoever. And um, he's a very highly educated man. He taught high school science for 15 years. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, he's he's been this great professor and he's been this and he has foreign degrees and, and all these other things. And, and uh, you know, he's debated some of the top evolutionists in the country. And No, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. And you can't make it different than that. I was going to say unfoolish. I don't know if that's really a word. <laughs> It's foolishness. But you see, when somebody's broken, when their pride is finally broken, and they come down to that level, and they're just like, I just, um, I can't continue like this. I don't know what's going on. My life is just a wreck. Everything's falling apart. God, if you're real, I need help. They're ready for salvation. You see? And you hear, and all of a sudden they hear, and they say, <clears throat> the Bible says that you're going to go to hell if you die in your sins. And you get that fear coming into you, and you go, Hell? You mean I'm gonna it gets worse than what I'm going through right now? I'm gonna burn forever on top of this? And then you hear the good news of the gospel. Jesus died for sinners. He didn't come for the righteous, he came for you, sinner. All those things that you struggle with, all those things that you are you just mess up and mess up and mess up. He died to pay for all of that. His blood can wash that all away. That's the good news. Not saying, well, actually all the earthquakes out there in the world right now, there, there's all these big earthquakes and the Bible says that there would be earthquakes in divers places in the end times. And, uh, you know, let's look at the seismic activity of the last three months or th things like this and, and whatever. And, I, and you know, I'll, I'll admit I've probably been guilty of some of this, you know, the apologetics type of stuff where you try to show lost people proofs of things and stuff like that. It's not supposed to be that way, brethren. It's about sin, not about science. Matthew chapter 11. Let's kind of talk a little bit about this, but we'll continue here. Matthew chapter 11. Begin in verse 25. At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it, it seemed good in thy sight. 